this part's relevant, so I'll start talking now. But uh, I went up to the U of URSU and listened to a presentation by Johan something, I don't know his last name. But um, he, in the lecture, introduced me to a guy named John Bellamy Foster, who I've been reading since and who is just like blowing my mind. He's really cool. Um, he's, a, he's the editor of the Monkey Review, which is a socialist publication. He's also a professor at University of Oregon. But um, that's kind of what got me interested in this topic, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so this lecture is a discussion about the relations between humans and the earth, between us and the natural environments that we depend upon to sustain us. This relationship between humans and the earth can be described as a metabolic relationship. Metabolism is, in essence, the interactions between an organism and its environment that are necessary to keep the organism alive. For the majority of plants, as an example, the metabolic process takes the form of photosynthesis, wherein they, it just designates the conversion of of carbon dioxide into food using energy from the sun, we all know about it. Um, for humans, in contrast, the metabolic process extends beyond biochemical reactions within our bodies to what we call labor. In other words, it's our labor that connects us to our environments and thereby sustains us. This labor process, or our metabolic interaction with the earth, could be as simple as picking a fruit from a low-hanging branch, or as is the case under industrial capitalism generally, the metabolic process could be a, a complex system of production, distribution, and consumption, involving an extraordinary division of labor. And we'll call this latter example humanity's predominant social metabolic order just because it's, it's a metabolic process that's also a social process, so hence social metabolic order. Um, labor is embedded in every step of this complex social metabolic order. And for that reason, any discussion of the relations between humans and the earth must account for the economic and political system or the mode of production that dictates our labor processes and our labor relations. In this case, the capitalist mode of production is what we'll be talking about. Mainstream environmentalism has been unable to provide solutions to established and developing environmental problems because it's been unwilling to include capitalism in its analysis, focusing instead on reform, on market-based solutions and solutions and technological fixes. So it's worth beginning by briefly noting a few important characteristics of the capitalist mode of production. And I apologize if this section is maybe a little um, basic and you guys already have an understanding of this. I didn't know it was going to be here or anything, but I hope it's valuable. So first we need to understand the basic idea, known instinctively to every business person, that capitalism is driven by the pursuit of the maximization of profit, or the profit motive. This applies to both individual capitalists and the capitalist class as a whole. The goal for, this, excuse me, the, goal for the capitalists and the capitalist class is not to improve the conditions of our lives. Video game systems and washing machines and backpacks and couches, iPads, or whatever, they're not made because the capitalists care about our well-being. They're made to generate profit for the capitalist class, and that's it. The protest sign we've probably all seen, like Occupy events and stuff, that says uh, people over profit is could maybe be said to like really be kind of an anti-capital sentiment, decrying the the kind of the nature of capitalism, which is profit over people. And if there's ever any social good created by capitalism, it's it's kind of a byproduct of sorts, like a side effect of just the pursuit of private riches. It needs to be noted also this pursuit of profit is one of immediacy. Profit is sought in the short term. Capitalists are necessarily short-sighted because of the cutthroat competitive nature of capitalism. Profits need to be generated as much as possible and as quickly as possible. If a capitalist fails to do so, they'll be put out of business by a more effective capitalist who is able to secure the former's niche in the market. One capitalist always kills many. That's why capitalists are going to sacrifice significant profits for perhaps some personal moral obligation or something of one kind or another generally won't last long. The best the benevolent capitalist can really hope for in the long run is to be bought out be swallowed rather than killed. Another key characteristic of capitalism is its eternal need for expansion. Capitalism is a grow or die system. The expansion of capital and the rise of profitability stagnates or begins to decline. Capitalism is launched into economic crisis, recession, or depression. Unfortunately for the capitalists, due to the crisis of overproduction, this rise of profitability and expansion of capital goes and will always go through so-called boom and bust cycles, or as the, the economists refer, uh, the business cycle. Uh, overproduction leads to a stagnation of profits, which translates eventually into an economic crisis. Capitalism must grow, again, grow or die. A third concept should be obvious once we understand capitalism's grow or die nature, and it regards barriers and boundaries to the expansion of capital. Capitalism is capable of recognizing barriers of various types, including ecological ones, uh, but it recognizes these barriers only as obstacles and difficulties to be overcome and to be transcended. What capitalism cannot recognize, however, are boundaries. 
Boundaries are the absolute limits that cannot simply be transcended or overcome. They're insurmountable. If capitalism ever recognized a boundary or a limit to its growth, uh, the result would be the truly odious realization that capital, at least to the capitalist, that capital cannot expand forever. But the truth is that these boundaries, these absolute limits, they do exist, and it's a few of these boundaries that I want to discuss next. The boundaries discussed here, although other boundaries exist, are what can be called planetary boundaries. This is a term that was originally used by a group of 29 scientists led by Johan Rockström. Um, same first name as the guy who introduced me to this guy, which is interesting. But they're with the Stockholm Resilience Center. And the group, including Nobel laureate Paul Crutzen and leading U.S. climatologist James Hansen from NASA, identified and analyzed nine planetary boundaries that denote the environmental conditions necessary for maintaining an Earth system that can safely sustain human life. Or as they put it in the title of their seminal work, maintain a safe operating space for humanity. Uh, these nine planet I'm going to write them on the board, but these nine planetary boundaries are as follows. Climate change. Ocean acidification. Shorten that, I guess. Stratospheric ozone depletion. We have to shorten all of these. Uh, the nitrogen cycle. Biodiversity loss. Chemical pollution. Atmospheric aerosol loading. And the last, oh, excuse me, change in land use. And I guess I didn't make enough spaces because the last one is. I missed it, sorry. Kind of funny. Oh, global freshwater loss. As of yet, no scientifically adequate physical measures exist for two of the boundaries, chemical pollution and aerosol loading. Um, the others, though, can be regarded, excuse me, three of these boundaries, climate change, sorry, let me start over again. The other seven, though, have clearly designated boundaries, well studied by some of the most capable and studied scientists in the field that's most directly relevant to them. Three of the boundaries, climate change, ocean acidification, and stratospheric ozone depletion, can be singularly regarded as tipping points which at certain levels destabilize the planet by marking, excuse me, making massive qualitative changes in the Earth system. And this destabilization, of course, has incredible consequences for humans and all forms of life. The other four boundaries better signal the beginning of environmental degradation that becomes irreversible. It's worth jumping into the details, though not too deeply, to illustrate that the planetary boundaries model is far more than mere abstraction and suggestion. We're talking about empirical science, it's not just doomsday prophesying. In the model, each of the nine ecological processes are given a pre-industrial value. Oh, you guys can remember that. Pre-industrial value. Uh, proposed boundary. And a current status. The pre-industrial value is defined as the level reached before the advent of industrial capitalism. The science used to establish the proposed boundaries for each of the ecological processes is really complex, and so and it's different for each one, so it's probably not worth jumping into for this one, but it's worth noting that it's that it basically um, is the scientific consensus both within Rockstrom's group and without. So starting with climate change, the pre-industrial value is 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide of carbon concentration in the atmosphere, and the proposed boundary is 350 parts per million, and the current status is 390 parts per million. I'm just going to go through each of these real quick. Ocean acidification values refer to a global mean saturation state of aragonite to form of calcium carbonate in surface seawater. 
A decline in this number indicates an increase in the acidity of the ocean. The pre-industrial value is 3.44, proposed boundary is 2.75, and the current status is 2.9. Stratospheric ozone depletion measurements concern the density of ozone in the ozone layer measured in Dobson units. The smaller the number, the greater the hazard. Pre-industrial value is 290. The proposed boundary is 276. And the current status is 283. The boundary for the nitrogen cycle indicates the amount of nitrogen that can safely be removed from the atmosphere for human use in millions of tons per year. Before industrial capitalism, the amount was zero. And the proposed boundary is 35 million tons per year. The current status is 121 million tons per year. Biodiversity loss, measured by the number of species lost per million species every year, has a pre-industrial value of 0 0.1 to 1 um, per million, and that's the natural rate of species loss, basically. The proposed boundary is 10 per million, and the, the current status is more than 100 per million which is 101,000 times the pre-industrial rate. As mentioned earlier, no adequate measurements have been established for chemical pollution or atmospheric aerosol loading. There have been suggestions for how to do this, but none of them are probably accurate yet. So, And parameters for change in land use are set by the percentage of global ice-free land surface converted into cropland. In pre-industrial times, the percentage was very low. No accurate data was actually ever recorded. But the proposed boundary is 15%. So, you don't know on that one, but it's low. Uh, Pros boundary is 50%, and after this, there's a danger of tr triggering catastrophic effects on ecosystems globally. And the current status is currently 11.7. Lastly, annual freshwater use in pre industrial times was 415 cubic kilometers. Uh, the proposed boundary is 4,000 cubic kilometers. And the current status is 2,600 cubic kilometers. While climate change is taking the forefront of public concern, it should be made clear that all of these boundaries need to be given careful and individual attention. This is especially true because all of the ecological process, processes interact in highly intricate ways. Changes in any one of the processes uh, indicate... That, actually, yeah, what's that question now before? Because I was just going to ask, just to verify, is the proposed, is that what's, is that considered sustainable, or is that just like a first step? Yeah, so this, this number indicates just if you go beyond that number, if you go beyond that number, then you, you've exceeded the boundary, and, and then depending on which, which boundary it is, all sorts of terrible things happen. Does that make sense? Okay. And so any, anything um, before this boundary is safe. Maybe not great, Rel but safe at least. least. Yeah, relatively safe enough. enough. Safe yeah, perfect. safe enough would be a good way to put it, yeah. <laughs> okay, so while climate change is taking the forefront of public concern, it should be made clear that all these boundaries need to be given careful and individual attention. This is especially true because all of these ecological processes interact in highly intricate ways. Changes in any one of the processes is capable of producing cascading effects throughout one or all of the others. Um, in fact, an important principle in ecology is the interconnectedness, not just between these ecological processes, but between all elements within our Earth system. Keystone species are an interesting way to get a glimpse at this interconnectivity. An example of a keystone species is the sea star. Sea, star, excuse me, sea stars may prey on sea urchins, mussels, and other shellfish that have no other natural predators. If the sea star is removed from the ecosystem, mussel populations explode uncontrollably and they drive out most other species, and the urchin population basically annihilates coral reefs. So while sea stars are relatively minor in abundance, they exert a disproportionately large effect on their environments. In an ecosystem, all the elements have important roles and fill important niches. Discur excuse me, disturbing an ecosystem, even if it seems like a minor disturbance, can have really large effects that no one probably would have ever expected, except maybe someone who had studied the science. Um, the effects of ecological disturbance can sometimes proceed slowly, but they can also be rapid. It's important to keep this principle of interconnectedness between elements of our Earth system in mind. Going back to the nine planetary boundaries, if we look at the current status of, of each boundary, we'll see that three of them have already exceeded proposed boundaries, and those are climate change, um, biodiversity loss, and the nitrogen cycle. So those are the ones that have already 
um, exceeded their boundaries. Each of these constitute in their own right a rift in the, natu the natural functioning of the Earth system. The word rift is taken from the language of Marx in a section of the Grundrisse in which he describes the robbing of the soil of nutrients in the countryside and introduces the notion of the metabolic rift. By understanding what is meant by a metabolic rift, we can better understand the effects of capitalism on the environment. When Marx introduces the metabolic rift, he's discussing the work of German chemist Justice von Liebig, I don't know if I'm saying that right, uh, studying British agriculture in the 1850s and 60s. Liebig explained how soil requires particular nutrients, excuse me, nutrients in order to produce crops. It's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, crops take up these nutrients as they grow and turn them into food to be consumed. In earlier societies, these nutrients were returned to the soil via the natural fertilizer we call shit. But as industrial capitalism was continuing to develop, people became congregated in towns and rural areas were depopulated, phenomenon, a phenomenon usually called the division between town and country. Uh, land ownership was concentrated and people from the countryside were forced into close quarters where they could work in industrial settings. What this meant is that the crops, along with all of the nutrients that they take up as they grow, had to be shipped from the countryside into the cities to support the growing populations there. And so instead of the nutrients from human waste being recycled back to the land as they were before, they began to accumulate as toxic waste and contribute to the pollution in the cities. Human excrement, once a source of nourishment for the land, is now a source of toxicity and pollution. When nutrients are taken from the soil and recycled back to the same land, it can be called a closed nutrient cycle. Industrial capitalism opened, or in Marx's terminology, created a rift in this nutrient cycle. With the new rift, soil fertility in Britain began to diminish rapidly. The result, ultimately, was British imperialism. The British, along with other core nations at the time, took control of guano deposits in Peru and Chile. Uh, guano is a fancy word for uh, seabird shit and bat shit, basically. And it's really high in nitrogen and phosphorus, so it works really well as a fertilizer, and this is what they used. Uh, so basically, they imperialized Peru and, Guam, excuse me, Peru and Chile to get a hold of this. Because the British had depleted their own soil of nutrients, it became necessary to rob other countries of their own. This is before a thing called the Haber-Bosch process was discovered. Uh, basically, it allows them to make artificial fertilizer, the kind we use now out of oil. And so, but now that we can do that, imperialism basically has merely shifted its focus uh, from Peru and Chile to the oil fields of, of Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. Uh, this short history lesson, I hope, helps to explain the metabolic rift. Essentially, a rift is a pressure point or a break in an ecological process or natural environment. The British, under the necessary result of capitalism, which was the division between town and country, created a rift in the nutrient cycle, and what followed was what, what we can call a shift. So we have rifts and then shifts. Under capitalism, these rifts are being created constantly in the efforts to achieve massive profits for the already super rich. <coughs> also, and this is one of the most important things to remember from this lecture, under capitalism, metabolic rifts are never addressed or adequately dealt with. Instead, these pressure points or these rifts are simply shifted around. The British shifted their ecological problem via imperialism to Peru and Chile, where the robbing of century-old guano deposits created new problems. When capitalism merely shifts ecological problems around, it's an example of the previously mentioned characteristic of capitalism, its inability to recognize boundaries. It recognizes the ecological crisis as merely a barrier and proceeds to overcome this barrier by shifting the ecological crisis either to a new geographic location or more likely by shifting the crisis qualitatively where one crisis, they solve one crisis by creating a new one basically, oftentimes a worse crisis. Uh, recall the planetary boundaries, especially those three that have already been crossed. Um, each boundary exceeded can be called a planetary rift. The boundaries together comprise what Marxist ecologist John Bellamy Foster calls the global ecological rift. Now recall the three characteristics of capitalism mentioned earlier. One, capitalism is based on profit. Two, it must expand indefinitely. And three, it only recognizes barriers as obstacles to be overcome. Because profit is the primary driver of the capitalist system, Rifts like that of the nutrient cycle in Britain in 1850 and 60 are created. Capitalism doesn't, cannot concern itself with things like maintaining soil fertility if it gets in the way of, of profits, um, in the immediate future profits as quickly as possible. So the profits of an individual capitalist must expand and capitalism as a system must continue to be the same. Soil fertility is a barrier to the expansion of capital, but capitalism figures out a way to overcome this obstacle, regardless of the damage done to the environments and to life by doing so. 160 years later, capitalism still hasn't figured out how to fix the rift it created in the soil, or excuse me, in the nutrient cycle of the soil. 
This rift is absolutely still relevant with over half of our population currently residing in cities and megacities. And in fact, the rift has actually become much worse, and the results are horrendous. Today, corporations like Monsanto use and also patent genetically modified seeds, and these seeds are more responsive to water and nutrients, uh, which allows the corporation to grow the largest crops it can. So it's just like huge, like larger than normal crops. Um, and it gives it maximum profits. But in generating those maximum profits, it also makes each and every plant genetically identical, which makes them more vulnerable to pests. This leads to the need for large amounts of pesticide and oil-based fertilizer. Step back and it becomes apparent that our own imperialist country goes to war under the guise of national defense, using our bodies and our lives to get oil for the fertilizer to grow crops using our labor, and proceeds to spray those crops with poison and then feeds it to us for profit. How could we allow this? Well, we allow it because we've accepted the, the logic of capitalism and its endless pursuit for profit. Capitalist, capitalist agriculture like that practiced by Monsanto is devastating for the soil, and the result is genetically modified foods and and excessive amounts of pesticide and oil-based fertilizers. This, of course, is only the beginning, though. Other effects of capitalist agriculture include literally mass human death, keystone species loss, habitat disruption, water poisoning, air pollution, dead zones in the ocean, genetic mutation in animal life, and a billion other things. The nutrient cycle rift in the soil is a subset of the planetary rifts divide, or excuse me, described by Rockstrom and his team. We are merely mag Excuse me, we've merely magnified one particular type of rift within the planetary rift. For this lecture, it's not possible to zoom out and detail each of these nine planetary rifts, but it's worth explaining one. I'll stick with climate change just because it's the one that uh, has been studied the most extensively, probably because it's the crisis that is, is uh, most devastating. It's the one at the forefront of public concern, like I've said, it's the one we're all worried about. So, um, In grade school, you probably learned about climate change, but they probably called it greenhouse gases and they might have even said something about global warming. Now we call it climate change to avoid being misleading. While global warming is still technically what's happening if we average global temperatures, different areas of the globe experience dramatically different like temperature changes. So averaged out, it's, it's still global warming, but uh, climate change is just less misleading. The IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, put out their fourth assessment, and this can be found online, and it's probably the best scientific document detailing the processes of climate change representing the professional opinions of climatologists and other types of scientists from around the globe. Um, here I think it's, it's interesting to make a note about the capitalist media's treatment of climate change. There was a fascinating paper produced in 2005, I think, at the University of California, I'm not sure on that, but in which the authors did an analysis of 928 peer-reviewed studies in science journals about climate change. The 928 studies represented every study they could find on climate change, every single one. Out of these 928 articles, exactly zero of them denied the existence of anthropogenic or human-induced climate change. Every single article agreed that humans have played an important role in causing climate change. Sorry. Analysis of media coverage, <coughs> on the other hand, was dramatically different. 53% of media coverage in four major newspapers, uh, the New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, and the Wall Street Journal, included the opinions of a scientist suggesting, on the one hand, that climate change existed and was caused by humans, and on the other hand, a spokesperson or other figure debating the claim that, and saying that climate change maybe didn't exist at all or was not caused by humans. So, and some of the coverage actually only included the opinion that climate change does not exist at all. The title of the media study um, is Balance is Bias. While appearing balanced and representative of both sides, media coverage has skewed dra dramatically public opinion and ignore the fact that in the scientific community, the other side, the side that doesn't think that climate change exists, doesn't, that side, it doesn't actually exist in any meaningful way, despite what we probably all think, because we've all been exposed to this idea that, oh, well, some people think it does, some people think it doesn't. Um, they've represented climate change as a controversial issue, something scientists didn't necessarily agree on, when in fact, the scientific consensus is absolutely clear. Climate change does exist. And here's a brief summary of the effects already being experienced, already in the early stages. Glaciers have shrunk, ice on rivers and lakes is breaking up earlier in the year, plants and animals are migrating towards the poles, so they're like, um, plants and animals that used to exist kind of towards the equator are migrating outward, all plants actually, to deal basically with rising global temperatures. Um, cold days, cold nights, and frost are less frequent over the land areas, hot days and hot nights are more frequent, heat waves over most land areas are more frequent, Global area affected by drought has increased since the 1970s. 
Um, it's 40% a few years back that was already affected, drought affected, and the projections are 75% by the year 2025. Um, tropical cyclone activity excluding tsunamis in the North Atlantic has increased in intensity and frequency of incidents. This is the summary version of effects already underway. Future effects are drastically more violent. Sea level rise is already having huge effects on low-lying coastal areas in entire island nation states. Here's an excerpt from a news article posted on March 9th of this year. The Pacific nation in Kiribati is negotiating to buy land in Fiji so it can move islanders under threat from rising sea levels in what could be the first climate-induced relocation of an entire country. <coughs> Enote Tong, Kiribati president, said he was in talks with Fiji's military government to buy up to 2,000 hectares of freehold land on which his 113,000 country people could resettle. Some of the Kiribati's 32 flat coral atolls which straddle the equator over 3.5 million square kilometers of ocean are already disappearing. The total land area is 811 square kilometers, and the average elevation is less than two meters above sea level. Villagers with seawater lapping at their feet have been forced to abandon settlements. Freshwater supplies and crops have been ruined by salt water, and storms are causing shoreline erosion. Um, other examples are widespread even now in the early stages of climate change. And again, remember that climate change is just one of these nine established planetary boundaries. And two of them, again, have already been crossed. Two of the others, including climate, or excluding climate change, three together. Um, it's possible also that even more uh, boundaries could be discovered. It's possible <coughs> these ones are the ones we know exist. So that's capitalism. Creating and then exacerbating the effects from planetary boundaries, it's already forced us across and pushing us closer and closer to crossing others. Each boundary crossed has extraordinary effects on the planet and consequently humans. I've talked about the state of our Earth and the contradictions between capitalism and a livable world. Uh, for the rest of the lecture, I want to talk about resolving those contradictions. First, let's consider the ways in which capitalism has attempted to manage the global ecological rift. The main thrust of environmental studies under capitalism is focused on managerial adjustments and technological fixes and market-based solutions. And it's of course been unwilling to question capitalism itself. For this reason, all attempts from all angles, particularly regarding climate change, have been utter failures. When the global ecological rift has gained any attention at all from the capitalist media and the capitalist politicians, the question has never been, how can we solve this crisis? Rather, the question is, paraphrasing, excuse me, paraphrasing Eric McBay and Derek Jensen, how can we solve this crisis without significantly changing the system that has created it in the first place? Perhaps the most obvious example of capitalism's failure to properly deal with the global ecological rift is that of the, the Copenhagen climate negotiations. You probably heard of that happened in December of 2009. Um, at the climate negotiations, the U.S. led the way in blocking every single course of action proposed except the most limited and voluntary market-based approaches. The result of the Copenhagen Conference was the so-called Copenhagen Accord, literally nothing more than a farce put forward in a last desperate attempt at face saving. The Accord is not legally binding in any way, and the delegates at COP15 of the Conference of Parties uh, to which it was sent didn't even adopt it. Rather, the only agreement made between the delegates, the delegates in their own words, were to uh, quote, take note of it. Uh, not exactly a cause for celebration. Also of note is the United Nations Kyoto Protocol, whose goal is the, quote, stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. The United States, Imperial Nation number one, is the only signatory to not ratify the protocol. However, even if the U.S. had ratified the protocol, um, it's been shown to be drastically insufficient to deal with the climate change crisis. Despite noble goals, if they are sincere, the treaty has failed to carry them out. Quoting the London School of Economics in the Hartwell Papers, the treaty, quote, has failed to produce any discernible real-world reductions in the emissions of greenhouse gases in 15 years. The World Bank noted that although the treaty was negotiated in 1997, by 2005, energy-related emissions had actually grown by 24%. So what sorts of market-friendly methods does capitalism offer to deal with this crisis? Perhaps the most progressive suggestion, if you can call it that, is cap and trade, or the carbon market, which is basically the creation of an artificial market based on carbon emissions trading. Um, firms are allowed to buy and sell permissions, basically, to emit carbon pollution. Uh, the largest active cap and trade program is in Europe, which has proven emissions trading incapable of reducing emissions. The only thing cap and trade has succeeded in is generating profits for speculators and corporations. This is the most progressive su suggestion to enter mainstream capitalist environmental studies 
And just despite being just completely inadequate, it's still balked at by conservative politicians here in the U.S. Perhaps the most common suggestions, on the other hand, for getting us out of the global ecological rift involve technology. Capitalist economists, to the extent that they recognize the problem at all, typically assert that capitalist innovation and development will lead to improved technologies and efficient raw material usage, and this will decrease emissions and environmental degradation. It needs to be said first that technological progress in the past has largely been the problem, not the solution. Second, more often than not, the economists suppose that technology can work magic. They suppose that somehow capital can continue to expand indefinitely by uh, dematerializing itself. That is, that more and more can be created using less and less and just producing things out of thin air. The ultimate goal, I suppose, being the perpetual motion machine, which somehow produces more energy than it consumes. As any physics major knows, this belongs in the realm of fantasy. The third thing to be said is perhaps the most important. I want to be clear that new technologies, existing technologies, like solar and wind, and even past technologies, uh, certainly have a place in a sustainable future, but not under capitalism. Because under capitalism, any improvements made in efficiency via technology will only serve to allow corporations to expand quicker. This idea is known as, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, it's J-E-V-O-N, uh, Jevons Paradox. I don't know if I pronounced that correct. I hope so. Um, the idea is known as Jevons Paradox, and the idea is to, it's, it's really important to understand, and so I'll explain it further. Um, any gains, again, in the energy efficiency mean the corporations will be able to spend less to produce the same amount. Because capital needs to expand as quickly and as much as possible, those savings made in efficiency will always be put toward expanding production. The scale effects of the resulting economic expansion will always outweigh the gains made in efficiency. Corporations come out the winners, and instead of curbing energy use, we just make it possible to expand production, increase consumption, and thereby contribute even further to environmental degradation, worsening the problem instead of fixing it. To illustrate the point, consider this example. Since 1975, the amount of energy expended per dollar of GDP in the U.S. has decreased by half, marking a deep, or excuse me, an increase in energy inefficiency. So they're marking an increase in energy efficiency, excuse me. In other words, it takes half the energy to make stuff that it did in 1975. But this doesn't mean that the U.S. is using half the energy it did in 1975. Instead, overall energy consumption has actually risen by 40%. The reason is that, just as the paradox asserts, increases in energy efficiency under capitalism can only lead to the expansion of the, sy of the system. Our Earth system, and ultimately we, suffer the consequences. But remember, the paradox only exists under capitalism, with increased profit being the primary driver. Truthfully, the mainstream environmental movement in the U.S. has really just settled itself with placing the burden, the environmental burden, on consumers. The consumers have to create the demand for environmentally products, they say. The consumers need to inflate their tires properly, buy more efficient light bulbs, ride bikes to school and work. Uh, the RSU's own pamphlet, I don't know, I hope everyone's seen it. I don't know if we like, have any with us or anything. I think Josh has not um, Has kind of a cool little bit of information just regarding that. Even if every single person, every single person in the United States did everything that people like Al Gore suggest in his, uh, the book, An Inconvenient Truth, like switching light bulbs, driving and uh, driving half as much, those sorts of things. Um, even if they did everything, U.S. carbon emissions would only fall by 22%, not even close to the 75 plus percent suggested by even non-radical climate scientists. The truth is that the huge majority of emissions in the U.S. and in the world come from corporations, not consumers. The truth is that under capitalism, corporations will never reduce emissions voluntarily. It runs against the logic of the system. The truth is that, as mainstream economist Lester Thoreau has stated, good capitalists will decide to do absolutely nothing about climate change, no matter how bad the effects. Eventually, a generation will come along that no longer has the opportunity to act. In his words, quote, each generation makes good capitalistic decisions, yet the effect is collective social suicide. Um, <clears throat> and I forgot to include this in the paper, actually, but I just wanted to also make a quick note about capitalism and its attempts to repair damage it does to the environment. Um, one example is uh, mountaintop removal mining. Uh, you've probably seen stuff about that. It's, they, they literally blow up mountains to get to coal that's underneath the mountains. Um, obviously this is extraordinarily destructive. Um, and so they blow up everything and then, and then their repair, the way that they repair that is to take all the stuff that they blew up and then just pile it back on the mountain. So all the life and everything there is dead. Uh, but then they just take all the rubble and pile it up and try and make it into kind of the same shape, and so that's that's the repair that we've got. 
Also um, related, uh, deforestation of old growth forests, like especially. Um, these things have been around forever, and they they cut down all the trees, and then they replace them with what look like basically like orchards. They're lines of uh, single species trees, so it's like monocropped. It's just lines of them. You know, how you, you drive on the road and see the orchards. Um, it's just like that. They're all the same species, and then on top of that, they're covered in pesticides so that they can like survive. And so half the time, they're like toxic, and nothing can live there anyway. Um, that's like that's like what we get. That's that's how capitalism like repairs the damage it does. Um, also, there's there's the BP example, and I forgot to include that too. But uh, we've seen how well BP has done it at um, fixing things. Um, it's still it's still a disaster down there. Um, there's I just watched this thing the other day about about how many um, animals have like genetic mutations and stuff. It's just like all sorts of diseases, just plagued by disease. Um, it's all still really terrible, and this is of course all because they they didn't replace that safety valve, which was like I don't remember a few thousand dollars or something, uh, like pennies to them, you know. Uh, they didn't do that, even though they knew that it was broken, and 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 then we still have this terrible crisis, which I found out recently also that they they got a tax deduction for that issue they had, that entire disaster. They got a, like a tax write off for that. Um, I don't know the details, but but somehow you know I don't know if anyone knows about it, but they they experienced like an economic like loss yeah loss economic loss and so bam tax write off for like destroying the entire they will probably for years. what's that they probably will have that write off for a very long time yeah probably i would guess so okay so at this point i hope it's absolutely clear that capitalism is incapable of providing us with an earth that we can inhabit safely and in good health so now i'll turn to the alternative to the only possible solution in short the solution is the negation of the capitalist mode of production and the implementation of international socialism Endless growth under capitalism is murdering the planet, and it's murdering us. As long as the capitalist system is small and can maintain outward growth, it can displace or again shift ecological debt and ignore the costs incurred. But when capital expansion reaches not just its regional limits, but its planetary boundaries, the global ecological rift it can't be shifted around anymore. It will be finalized in the most devastating of ways. Capitalism will destroy itself, and it will take most humans with it. That's if we let it get that far. Capitalism without growth, or stationary capitalism, is a contradiction. But the socialist mode of production is capable of existing as a, a steady state system, a system that doesn't need to expand, and because of this, it has the potential to save our planet. Socialism, with human welfare being the primary driver, not private riches, can plan an economy rationally and is unfettered by the for-profit institutions that demand increased production and increased consumption. Um, I saw a quote recently by this artist named Banksy. I don't know if you guys have heard Banksy. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, quote, they button to your life, take a cheap shot at you, and then disappear. They leer at you from tall buildings and make you feel small. They make flippant comments from buses that imply you're not sexy enough, and that all the fun is happening somewhere else. They are on TV making females feel inadequate. They have access to the most sophisticated technology the world has ever seen, and they bully you with it. They are the advertisers, and they are laughing at you. The, uh, the advertisers, as Banksy calls them, exist because capitalism has a need to convince you to consume goods you don't really need. They manufacture desires, and those desires conveniently always cost money. A socialist society doesn't require that. All that junk that capitalism produces can be done away with. Most of the things capitalism needs you to believe that you have to have are useless. And cutting away with this wastefulness is the first step to getting out of the global ecological rift, only under socialism. I want to talk, I want to talk about some of the achievements I want to talk about some of the achievements made in acknowledging the global ecological rift and efforts made to do something about it by socialist movements today. But I also want to be clear that just socialism is not the entire answer. Some of the worst ecological nightmares of the 20th century occurred in countries that called themselves socialist. Think of the nuclear, nuclear horror of Chernobyl or the poisoning and draining of the Aral Sea. Socialism doesn't necessarily make repair of the global ecological rift certain, but it will make it possible, and that's the important point. Socialism is a prerequisite, but not the whole solution. That said, let's consider a few cases. Uh, one of the most interesting to me is the, uh, the Bolivarian revolutionary process in Venezuela. Bolivarian revolution has developed a framework for pursuing food, so excuse me, sovereignty, food sovereignty, which has included putting food production and distribution under the control of small farmers and workers' collectives rather than agribusiness. Education, education, stressing agroecological sustainable practice, has become integral to the production process 
has marked a massive increase in seed saving, compost, and topsoil building through diverse native crop planting. Uh, the government has been able to support these practices by extending credit to farmers who use them. Uh, Venezuela, the law for integrated agricultural health, has mandated the phasing out of artificial pesticides and other toxic agrochemicals. And in line with this mandate, research facilities have been established to study and prove on, on already existing methods of, of natural pest control. Bolivia, like Venezuela, under the presidency of socialist Evo Morales, is striving for ecological and social justice. In 2010, they hosted the World People's Conference on Climate Change, uh, which is this really cool conference, um, well, here I'll explain, and Morales' invitation, over 35,000 activists from more than 130 countries, men, excuse me, many of them indigenous people, came together to do what the U.S. under Obama and other imperial nations refused to do in the Copenhagen conferences. At the conference, the, the Cochabamba Protocol, or the, the other title, the alternative title, the People's Agreement on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth, was drafted and sent to the UN, and the agreement right, rightly places responsibility for the climate price on the rich countries that have created it, in addition to adopting 18 major statements covering issues from climate change refugees to technology transfer and more. The rights of Mother Earth and the responsibilities of humans, especially first world countries, I mean, the rights that they have towards the Earth are firmly de the responsibilities they have towards the Earth are firmly declared. In the first section of the agreement, the following is written, quote, Humanity confronts a great dilemma, to continue on the path of capitalism, depredation, and death, or to choose the path of harmony with nature and respect for life. Imagine this sort of line coming out of such a meaningless document as the Copenhagen Accord. Um, and then also, and I didn't include this in the lecture either, but Co Cuba. Cuba has been sort of a shining example. Josh, I was hoping would actually be here, he's the one probably to talk to more about this, I didn't get to research it that much. But um, they were the only country, as far as I know, that, I think this was a few years ago, so since then maybe things have changed, I doubt it. They're the only country who qualified on the WWF's, the World Wildlife Fund? Uh, on their sustainability index as being having like a sustainable ecological footprint, the only country. Um, so there's that, but again, you might want to talk to Josh about that because I don't know a lot about it. The ecological socialist revolution that needs to happen here in the U.S. and throughout the world can learn a lot from these examples, implementing what has worked and improving on what hasn't. But I think it's worth sketching out further what might be included in the revolution. There's been one idea that's been particularly interesting to me because it's something that can be pushed for even right now, even under capitalism. Um, we're probably more likely in the transition, transition to socialism. And while socialism is the only way to truly fix things, this idea could make a major impact in building support for combating capitalist grade climate change. A socialist revolution needs desperately this popular support to succeed. Uh, the idea is proposed by James Hansen, who's the climatologist from NASA, who uh, helped develop the planetary boundaries idea model. Um, and he starts with, in his words, uh, quote, geophysical fact. So most of the remaining fossil fuels, especially coal, need to remain in the ground, and fossil fuel emissions need to approach practically zero as quickly as possible. It's a fact he starts with. In order to do this, he proposes a tough emissions tax on polluters that rises progressively, literally forcing industry to find better ways to fuel production. Such a strict tax might seem difficult to build support for with today's ecological and uh, political class consciousness, but Hansen feels he has a solution for this problem. A fund ought to be established, he says, into which all the tax proceeds would enter. Then, 100% of those proceeds should be distributed directly to the entire population on a monthly basis, based on their carbon footprints. The working class, and especially the poor, have a significantly lower carbon footprint, uh, which means money would flow downward from polluters and those in the, uh, the upper classes with the larger carbon footprints. And so he thinks that mass support could be built for it based on this because, I mean, the majority of people who have below average per capita carbon emissions would be getting money directly, like they'd probably be down with that, I would guess. Um, so he thinks he can, like, oh, they can overcome that problem of like, building support for it. Uh, personally, I think the, good, the idea is a good one, and I'd be thrilled to see it gain major traction, be it under capitalism or more likely in the transition to socialism. John Bellamy Foster and Fred Magdoff, writers for the socialist publication Monthly Review, and co-authors of the book What Every Environmentalist Needs to Know About Climate or me, About Capitalism, have created a list of eight characteristics that ecologically minded socialist societies would exhibit. Such a society would one, stop growing when basic human needs are satisfied. Two, not entice people to consume more and more. Three, protect natural life support systems and respect the limits to natural resources, taking into account needs of future generations. Four, make decisions based on long-term societal ecological needs while not neglecting sh the short-term needs of people. 
Five, run as much as possible on current energy instead of fossil fuels. Six, foster human characteristics in a culture of cooperation, sharing, reciprocity, and responsibility to neighbors in the community. Seven, make possible the full development of human potential. And eight, promote truly democratic political and economic decision making for local, regional, and multi-regional needs. Uh, MacDuff and Foster also include a short list of suggestions for some of the first measures such socialist societies might take in order to truly embody the above characteristics and create an ecologically sound and sustainable future. <clears throat> the list includes the following term, excuse me, the following items. Uh, actively supporting farmers to convert to ecological agriculture, defending local food production and distribution, introducing free and efficient public transport networks, rapidly phasing out fossil fuels and biofuels, replacing them with clean energy sources, restructuring existing extraction, production, and distribution systems to eliminate waste, planned obsolescence, pollution, and manipulative advertising, and providing forward training, retraining to all affected workers and communities, retrofitting, retrofitting existing homes and building for energy efficiency, and uh, closing down all military operations at home and elsewhere, transforming armed forces into voluntary teams charged with restoring ecosystems and assisting the victims of environmental disasters. Uh, this should help to illustrate, I hope, the undertakings of a true socialist ecological revolution, but it's not a one-size-fits-all list. The responsibilities are not equal throughout the globe, and imperialism, especially ecological imperialism in this case, which has built up imperial nations at the expense of third world and poor countries, needs to be recognized. Uh, the 350 parts per million of carbon concentration right there um, that's allowable in the atmosphere has already been taken up by rich nations. The entire globe suffers as a result of their actions. Now that it's necessary to restrict carbon emissions, poor developing nations cannot be further repressed and have emissions restrictions imposed on them to correct a problem they didn't create. A non-imperialistic global ecological revolution will depend on a strategy called contraction and convergence, uh, wherein there's a massive contraction, so a contraction of global emissions, but a convergence of, of per capita emissions in all countries. Essentially, this means that poor nations, especially those most affected by climate change in the global south, um, may actually be able to increase emissions uh, in order to converge with rapidly contracting emissions in rich nations. There also needs to be economic assistance, excuse me, there, sorry, there also needs to be economic assistance given to poor countries to help them implement renewable energy. Um, like that of solar. Lastly, a recognition of imperialism's role in the global ecological rift will demand a shift from extraordinary military spending into sustainability building and international assistance in this endeavor. Wealthy countries owe a massive ecological debt to the poor nations, and no socialist ecological revolution can ignore this. It's my firm belief, backed by scientific consensus, that we are in a state of crisis. And the crisis could soon be terminal if the global ecological rift is not mended extremely soon. Efforts to mend this rift under capitalism miss the point entirely. The cause is the capitalist mode of production, and without eliminating it, there is no hope. If there could be any future at all for humanity, that future must be a sustainable and socialist future. Marx wrote in Capital, quote, even an entire society, a entire excuse me, an entire society, a nation, or all simultaneously existing nations taken together, are not the owners of the earth. They are simply its possessors, its beneficiaries, and have to bequeath it in an improved state to succeeding generations as good heads of the household. In order to leave our earth in an improved state, dramatic efforts must be undertaken, and those efforts require socialism. Paraphrasing uh, John Bellamy Foster again, there is no ecological revolution that is not socialist, and in turn there is no true socialist revolution that is not ecological. That's it. Yeah.